I would just like to say how very pleased I am to be back at the British School at Athens, even if virtually, because I also had uh, a boost to my career in the early years from the BSA because I was school student back in 1984 to 1985. Um, in fact, a year when both school students were both students holding school studentships were women and we were both working on modern Greece. So it's not just the Irene and Lambrini generation that is bringing modern Greece strongly to the BSA. OK, so I will be talking to you today about Greek Euroscepticism after a decade of crises. And this is part of the research for the volume I'm preparing, which Lambrini Rory mentioned, uh, about Euroscepticism in Southern Europe over the past decade. And one of the chapters in this book is going to be an article by myself about Euroscepticism in Greece. So in this paper, I'm just going to try out a few of my ideas about what happened in Greece over the past decade. So just to make sure that we're all on the same page. Um, what is Euroscepticism? This is a term that was coined by a journalist back in 1985 to describe the British opposition to the deepening of its direction. In other words, the Thatcherite opposition to European integration. And the etymology of the word, of course, is not difficult for anybody who knows Greek. Um, it comes from skeptical, meaning to have doubts or reservations about something, and of course, Euro relating to Europe. So it's those who are skeptical about Europe. And the definition that it has come to acquire, particularly after the rise of the academic um, engagement with Euroscepticism after the late 1990s, has been opposition to European integration specifically, not Europe in general, but European integration, the European community and the European Union. And it's important to remember that Euroscepticism is not an ideology, it's not a worldview, it's just a political stance. And it's not a political program, it's a negative stance. It's an expression of discontent or protest. Um, it's also important to remember, and this is going to be significant for what I have to say, is that Euroscepticism does not necessarily mean Euro rejectionism or exit scepticism, as it sometimes calls. In other words, wanting to leave the European Union. And this was made very clear in the seminal article written by Paul Taggart in 1998, the article which really triggered the um, post Maastricht academic engagement with Euroscepticism, when he explained that Euroscepticism can, can express contingent or qualified opposition as well as outright and unqualified opposition. And this is an idea which Paul Taggart subsequently developed with his writing partner, Alex Serviak, and they came up with the idea of hard and soft Euroscepticism, with soft Euroscepticism being disagreement with the EU's current direction. And these two ideas, I think, are well summed up in the two logos that I have at the bottom of this slide. So hard Euroscepticism or exit scepticism or Euro rejectionism is, you know, vote leave in the UK referendum. Whereas soft Euroscepticism can be the idea that another Europe is possible. Another Europe is possible is, of course, the slogan of the radical left, which wants to see the EU adopt a different kind of policies, but it could also be another Europe is possible in terms of a different kind of EU, an EU of nation states like some of the radical right would like. And um, there's a key, Euroscepticism is a key issue for the sustainability of the EU. And very useful, I think, I think is to remember the classic political science um, theory of David Easton, his argument about political discontent not necessarily being, uh, being the, the signal for basic opposition, to, for basic antagonism towards the regime. So you can be discontented without it undermining the political system. And this is something that, that is important to remember when we're discussing Euroscepticism. 
So there is no automatic link between political discontent and loss of support. Public discontent doesn't necessarily have to be system threatening. And that's one of the things that we're going to talk about today. Um, scholars of Euroscepticism engage, when they're looking at Eurosceptic attitudes, they engage either with political parties or with mass publics. I'm sorry, I do apologize for the motorbike going past outside. There's nothing I can do about it. Um, so the Eurosceptic attitudes we either look at political parties or mass publics, public opinion. Um, and that's a di two different kinds of Euroscepticism that we study. This presentation today is talking about the second kind, which is public opinion, otherwise known as popular public or mass Euroscepticism. And my study of public opinion in Greece is based on the Eurobarometer surveys, which are conducted by the European Commission every six months. And the Eurobarometer surveys have a rather hegemonic position, I would say, in the study of public opinion in the EU. And that is the three very important reasons. The first is that the data is free and publicly accessible. So academics can easily access it instead of having to get massive funding to pay for their own survey. So it's a very useful, easy option. The second reason is that the Eurobarometer surveys actually go back as far as 1974, looking at the then members of the European community. So they, they have long time data series. And the third reason is that it offers the opportunity to compare individual countries with other members of the EU or with an EU average, with the average position of the, EU, the societies in the EU member states at the time. Of course, there are problems with using the Eurobarometer. And one of these is that like all bodies that commission public opinion surveys, the European Commission has its own agenda. And its own agenda is to show how popular the EU is basically. And therefore from time to time, it discontinues questions which may give answers that um, the European institutions would prefer that people were not giving. Um, why look at Greece? Well, we don't really need to say this in a seminar for the BSA and the Greek Politics Specialist Group, but um, I'm always very keen in explaining to people how important Greece is when you're looking at the study of European integration. And I think Greece is a very interesting case study. First of all, because before the crisis, there was a very strong permissive consensus in Greek society. The permissive consensus is the theory developed by Lindbergh and Scheingold back in 1970, suggesting that while the EU was not, while the European community as it was then, was not experiencing a major transfer of public loyalty to, from the national to the European level, what was happening was that the majority of public opinion in the then European community was actually prepared to give a kind of permissive consensus to allow things to move forward so it's a kind of passive support rather than an active support. And what we see in Greece is Greece was a classic example of this. There was a broad consensus from the late 1980s, from a few years after Greece's accession, in favour of Greece's European community membership. And if you look at the orange line, you'll see that this was always the largest group in public opinion, and it becomes a majority actually from the second half of 1988. And it becomes a very big majority from the early 1990s. And Greece is much less affected by the decline in support for European integration that is sometimes called the post Maastricht blues, the decline in support in public opinion support for the EU that um, came from the early 1990s onwards. And then another reason, of course, is that. If we're talking about the impact of the decade of crises, Greece was in the front line of two of these crises, the Eurozone crisis and uh, the refugee crisis. And one of the things that uh, caused a big shock in Europe in terms of public opinion was the Greek referendum of the 5th of July 2015, when Greeks were asked to vote on the latest bailout terms from the EU and the IMF. And the result was a resounding no, 61% of the vote saying no. 
and on quite a high turnout, 62.5%. And this was also very interesting. So it wasn't just, it wasn't a marginal yes of the type that we saw in the United Kingdom in the referendum that came a year later. Um, it was a much bigger majority saying no to the EU. And it was also a countrywide phenomenon, as you can see here. Um, every single electoral constituency voted for it and by generally large majorities. I mean, the, the lowest majority, as you can see here in one electoral constituency was 53%. So this was a big shock. It suggested a big change in Greek public opinion from the permissive consensus of the uh, pre-crisis era. So let's have a look at what happens during the decade of crisis. So first of all, we have the Greek sovereign debt crisis, which of course mutates into the Eurozone crisis. And this has a very big impact on the Greeks' experience of European integration because it basically redefines the narrative. The narrative of European integration, the positive narrative, which was underlying that permissive consensus, was that European integration had stabilized Greek democracy, had strengthened Greek sovereignty, Greek national sovereignty, and also, of course, had brought economic prosperity. And what Greeks experienced during the um, Eurozone crisis was a recipe of austerity, which was delivered as made in the EU um, through the three EU IMF bailouts resulting in when the question was asked on one occasion in a Eurobarometer survey in 2015, a typical example when the question wasn't asked again when the European institutions didn't like the answer, 75% of Greeks thought that the EU was responsible for European austerity compared to the 60% EU average. And of course, we also had the Troika, the representatives of the uh, European Commission, the European Central Bank and the IMF, um, whose uh, role in Greece appeared to overturn the narrative both about the EU strengthening sovereignty and strengthening democracy. And the impact, of course, was fairly immediate. Um, we can see some indicators here, a question what the EU means to me personally. And what is quite interesting is that these indicators, okay, we see the overturning of the narrative about democracy and economic prosperity. But what I found very interesting, why I've included this as a slide, is that we even get the overturning of the narrative of the EU meaning peace. Public opinion in Greece became so negative to the EU that they didn't even regard it still as supporting peace. And you can see that on all these indicators over the early years of the crisis, um, those who felt that this is what the EU represented fell to approximately half of what they were before the, the uh, crisis hit the country. So what we saw in Greece as a, as a result was a big rise in Eurosceptic sentiment. And this Eurosceptic sentiment is very clearly events driven. It's not a general rise in Eurosceptic sentiment as a result of general disillusion with institutions, it's very clearly a chronological response to specific things that were taking place. And in fact, we see the same in other South European countries, a clear response to the bailouts. Um, so there's a very big response to the first bailout in Greece. We can see that on quite a number of these indicators, the Eurosceptic response um, in some cases, even doubles, okay? So membership seen as a bad thing goes up from 14% to 33% uh, and so on. I don't need to read out the numbers for you. You can see them yourselves. What I'm comparing here, by the way, is the last survey before the bailout. So the survey that was conducted in early November of 2009 with the survey that took place uh, literally just a few weeks after, uh, no, the survey that took place um, in spring of 2011. So it gives you the chance to compare. And we also see another rise 
after the second and third bailouts. Okay. Um, not such a big rise, not such a big jump in Eurosceptic sentiment. It's the first bailout that is the real shock to public opinion, but the second and third bailouts bring new rises in uh, Eurosceptic sentiment, as you can see here on a number of indicators. And I think the impact of the bailouts is very clear in this time data series on trust in the EU. So if you, just look at this, the green line is those who tend to trust the EU and they were the majority until the first bailout, the crossover point, as you can see, when those who tend to mistrust the EU become the majority, occurs in spring of 2010, exactly when the bailout happens. And we then see another jump, so it's an 11% jump in mistrust occurring at the time of the uh, second bailout, and another jump, it's 8%, um, a smaller jump, uh, at the time of the third bailout. My argument would be that the third bailout wasn't less resented by Greeks, but at that point, um, the negative public opinion really didn't have very much further to go. I mean, how much further can you go than 80% public opinion? So this was the response to the bailouts. And then we also had the Schengen border crisis, Schengen and closing of the borders crisis, closing of the Balkan route and therefore trapping of refugees in, in Greece in the spring of 2016, which of course was a crisis of EU solidarity. It caused considerable resentment in Greece because Greeks felt that they were being left to deal with the problem. But there was also a new Grexit threat, no longer a threat of exit from the Eurozone, but this time a threat of exit from Schengen, um, which was frequently misrepresented in Greece actually as a threat to lose freedom of movement within the EU, which was not the case, but it was the way that many Greeks understood it. And the spring of 2016 is actually the high point of Greek public Euroscepticism during this last decade. So, if we take a look at this table, um, we can see how very striking this intense Greek dissatisfaction with the direction of European integration has become by spring of 2016. Um, so Greece on all these indicators is well above the EU average. Look at interests of our country not well taken into account. 33 percentage points above the EU average, for example. Um, it's ranked first in on this, these indicators of dissatisfaction on every single one of these. Greece is the most dissatisfied, dissatisfied society within the EU at this point. And I think what is very striking is that this is just literally, the, this um, survey was taken in May of 2016, so it is just weeks before the Brexit referendum, but we see that actually dissatisfaction in the UK is at much lower levels than it was in Greece. And that, of course, leads to a puzzle. So the puzzle is that this dissatisfaction with the EU in the UK translates into exit scepticism. So from the autumn of 2012, there is a question asked in the Eurobarometer, our country could better face the future outside the UK, outside the EU. Um, this is essentially a referendum question. It's essentially asking people how they would vote in a referendum, in or out. And it's a binary choice. You aren't offered any, maybe, I don't know, whatever. And what we see here is that throughout the period leading up to the Brexit referendum, although the gap does narrow a bit in the UK when people start to think a bit more seriously about what might happen, um, that um, the largest group is always in favor of exit skepticism. In the spring of 2016, you can see there is a clear difference. There's eight percentage points difference. And there is, of course, 18% of the population at that point who are still declaring they don't know. 
And as we know, many of those don't know is also shifted into the um, exit camp. But in fact, I always say to my students that if David Cameron had been reading the Eurobarometer, he would never ever have called a referendum on EU membership because the message about the UK is loud and clear and it's loud and clear going back decades. In the Greek case, our puzzle is in the Greek case, why doesn't the much more intense discontent with the EU that we see in Greece turn Greeks into exit skeptics? And what we see here is the reverse picture of what we saw in the UK. It's that column of agree better outside the EU is shorter in every single case, even in the spring of 2016, when the Greeks are very, very discontented with the EU, and it goes up to 44% saying Greek, Greece would be better off outside the EU, even then, this is below the number saying that Greece should remain within uh, the European Union. So this is the puzzle, and my answer has two parts. So the first part of my answer is the very high levels of support in Greece for the Euro. And we see a very interesting pattern with the Euro. I've shown the time data series going back to before Greece entered the Euro, because what we see there is that there was a lot of support for the Euro in Greece before Greece joined the Euro. And then when the Euro was introduced and it was believed in Greece, as in some other countries, to be contributing to inflation in particular, Greeks became rather skeptical about the euro. You can see that society is polarized in the mid 2000s. But once the eurozone crisis starts, once the Greek sovereign debt crisis starts, and there is a threat of a Grexit, of a Greek exit from the eurozone, Greeks become enthusiastic supporters of the euro. So this is a stabilizing factor for Greece's European Union orientation, which does not, of course, hold for the UK because the UK is not part of the euro and the Greek public does not, the British public does not want to join the euro. And my second argument is following on from the excellent book by Catherine de Vries on um, Euroscepticism and the future of European integration, in which she suggests a benchmarking theory of Euroscepticism. And she suggests that whether Euroscepticism translates into exit skepticism, Euro rejectionism, as we talked about earlier, depends on whether you think the nation state is a reasonable alternative. So what I have here in this um, table are some indicators of national confidence, as I call it, or lack of national confidence in this case, because what I've shown are the negative indicators. So it's dissatisfaction with national democracy, tendency not to trust public institutions. And what we can see here is very, very high levels of dissatisfaction with the national political system, much, much higher than in the EU. Look at these differences, over one third, you know, more than one third of the population difference between the EU and Greece. Once again, Greece is ranked first. So Greece is not only discontented with the EU, it's Greeks are also discontented with their national political system. Whereas in the UK, there is actually seems to be quite a lot of confidence in the national political system, which leads the UK, in contrast to Greece, to see Brexit as an alternative. Um, and so, just carrying on from this, it's not just a lack of uh, confidence in the institutions. Um, there are also more general indicators of confidence. Greeks have no, had no confidence in spring of 2016. They had no confidence in the future. Um, they felt that things were much better in the past. Things were going in the wrong direction in Greece. The national economy was bad and they were dissatisfied with the life they lead. And by huge differences from the EU 27, and of course, very striking differences from the UK. I mean, this could also open a discussion on the extent to which um, Brexit was actually a vote of discontent as it's so often discussed, but whether there is also a vote of national confidence there. Um, but that is not a discussion for today. So 
What has happened since the spring of 2016, which, as I mentioned, is the high point of uh, Euro discontent in Greece? Um, we've had a decline in Eurosceptic sentiment, but it's been moderate. Um, you might say it's not so moderate. In five years, there's been a drop in mistrust of the EU by 19%, but look at how it compares to the, the situation before the crisis. So levels of mistrust of the EU, it's still almost two thirds of the population in Greece mistrust the EU, whereas back in 2007, uh, almost two thirds of the population uh, trusted the EU. So there's, been a very small restoration of confidence. And this is also shown on some other indicators. So we can see comparing 2016, spring of 2016, with the latest Eurobarometer survey, which is called 2020-21, because owing to COVID, it wasn't carried out in autumn of 2020, as would have been expected. It was carried out very early in 2021. So it's in it's February, early March of 2021, so it's, it's pretty recent data. So if we compare these, we can see that over this five year period, there has been a drop on these Eurosceptic indicators, but it's not what you would call a radical drop. It really is quite a moderate drop. And Greeks remain the most uh, disaffected um, society within the EU in terms of all these negative indicators. So Greece is still ranked first on all of these, apart from not feeling a citizen of the EU where it comes second. It's still significantly above the EU. The, the difference between the EU average and uh, the Greek numbers are, is of course not as striking as it was uh, back in 2016, um, but it's still a difference which in some cases comes to you know, one fifth of the population. Uh, difference. And so the headlines from the Eurobarometer survey, now I always, I mentioned that the, the aim of the European Commission, of course, is to show that things are going well in Europe. And so the headline from the Eurobarometer surveys is always that there is a majority within the European Union in favor of staying inside the EU. That question, our country could better face the future inside the EU, agree or disagree, the referendum question. In itself, a question that forces people to take a position and therefore drives up the numbers in both groups, because in fact, there are other questions which show that there's huge ambiguity about the EU. Um, I didn't put a slide on about this, but there is a question about the image of the EU in which uh, people can say whether they have a positive, negative or neutral image of the EU. And the largest group in Greece in the latest survey is actually those with a neutral image of the EU, 42%, more than either positive or negative. So th there's a large part of the population that really is a bit ambivalent, doesn't know where they stand and so on. But the better inside or outside question forces you to take a position and what this has resulted in across the EU, because the uh, Greek numbers are actually pretty close to the EU average, is around two thirds saying better inside and one third saying better outside. So in Greece, you get 66% saying things are better inside the EU. So that sounds very good in terms of EU support. But then have a look at these other indicators and you see that in fact, there is still all this Euro discontent. And in particular, um, I've highlighted the question about attachment to the EU. The, in terms of the, in the EU average, um, the EU average is also like Greece, 66% better inside the EU, but 60% feel attached to the EU. In Greece, as you can see, 43% feel attached to the EU, although 66% say they want to stay in. So what this suggests is that Greeks no longer love the EU. Um, this is the, the title of an article that I published a few years ago with some colleagues, which at that time it was called, we no longer love you, but we don't want to leave you. And I think that this still applies um, to the, the Greek attitude towards the EU. Greeks don't want to leave the EU, 
they feel safer inside, but there isn't a strong feeling of attachment. And there is a lot of discontent underneath, which is something that um, could suggest trouble ahead. Okay, so I will stop sharing. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you, Susanna. Um, Irini can start now commenting. In the meantime, uh, people can start also posting their questions in the Q&A space. So Irini, the floor is yours. Uh, thank you so much. And thank you, Susanna, for always uh, making kind of uh, accessible political science, especially to historians. You're uh, one of the few people that actually also you know, uh, pays attention and uh, has, I consider you half a historian, you have a historian hat and a political scientist hat, and it makes it quite intriguing uh, to be able to understand this data in this kind of bigger, contextualizing this data and making more sense of it uh, from a myriad of different perspectives. So um, it's always really a delight uh, to hear you speak or read your work. Um, what I actually was quite um, impressed with, uh, with your presentation is that you know this year we've been celebrating the 40 years of our formal relationship with the EU as a full member um, since the signing of the Treaty of Accession in 1979. And you know because I had I had written a book, I was invited in different events, or I I you know I I listened to different events that were taking place, and there was such a euphoric uh, moment. I mean, it happens in university, but in reflection, I felt that. The last decade had been forgotten in a way. We talked about our existential belonging to Europe, uh, that this is our future, that this money will be pouring in from the recovery fund. And I feel that we're in our you know, little bubble again with the elites expressing one opinion and that it has a, a huge discrepancy from what you are revealing here from the Eurobarometer data, that there is a deep dissatisfaction still running, quite not as uh, extreme and at high levels as before, uh, but still there. And what is more, and I, I find that even more intriguing is that we talk so much about this ideational attachment to of Greeks to the EU when clearly you, you're you're you are kind of um, showcasing the, the opposite. The, the attachment is not as strong as we claim. The narrative that is built from elites and from media seems to have a huge divergence, at least based on the Eurobarometer data, of what is going on. So I think this is a good sober note when we are kind of you know reflecting back on the 40 years and trying to predict the next 40 of how you know uh, public sentiment moves on. Having said that, I think what interesting point you raised is that and you know we barely touched it as historians you know what is the impact okay we know they don't love it as you said but what really would that mean if you are in government how are you treating this information probably you don't hold the referendum as you said but you know even in Greece we did hold the referendum we did the exact opposite uh, so there is a question you know how much of this politicization of the of, of, of this of the European issue is really having an impact on if you're a government in day-to-day -day politics. Um, and I was really wondering, I mean, it's a big question, I understand that, but I did wonder, you know, uh, we are talking about this so much and it, it, it really kind of um, makes you think that when there is such a low trust in the EU, which is accompanied with even lower trust in, in your own national institutions, there is a crisis for the democratic process. This is, you were right when you said, you know, as Peter Merck has said, you can have a policy rejection of the EU, you're not rejecting the polity, but that doesn't mean that it's bad for the democratic regime. Maybe it's actually a, a sign of, you know, a, 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 a sign of a good working democratic regime. But here you have a double a slam, a sleep in both kind of trust in both the EU and the national institutions. So my second kind of um, question to you, and I was like, maybe we can open it up to the uh, to the public, to the audience as well is, um, you know, how worrying is this really in terms of thinking about this kind of dissatisfaction uh, and how it runs from, you know, because you said it was event driven. But it's interesting to see, I mean, is this something that may change? We cannot predict what will happen, uh, but there's also some kind of, um, uh, let's say, foundation element that seem that you see um, you seem constantly being appearing through this, you know, cross, uh, cross temporal analysis, that, that which is a great benefit of the Eurobarometer, I guess, because you can really compare and give a historical uh, as well aspect. 
And the third thing, and I'll sum it up, you know, there are all this, there seems to be a plethora of definitions about, uh, you know, skepticism, you know, soft heart, uh, policy, uh, polity. I mean, there are millions to even think about. And I was, and uh, you, you are very aware of the criticism to the Eurobarometer. You have mentioned it in your own work. You have defended the merits of using the Eurobarometer data. But including all of that, I mean, what I, what I was thinking, should we at the same time paying the same attention to the, the issue of, you know, uh, Europhilia and kind of how that is, because it seems to be it's a specific question to your barometer, I understand it. Uh, but my co concern is, do we need a more nuanced analysis of the uh, of uh, of positive attitudes toward European integration as well. In a way, maybe the answer lies as well in when we have Europhilic moments. I mean, I always think, you know, what was happening in the UK in the late 1980s, there was a huge Europhilic moment that we tend to forget. And I always wonder as a historian, you know, what was happening in the late 80s, early 90s that UK has such a turn uh, of public sentiment. And this is just one example because you're doing this amazing, I think that's the great benefit of this cross temporal analysis and institutional data is that you are able to kind of offer as well a nuanced uh, definition of what it means where we really always such great supporters as the myth has it uh, and you've said that or you have discussed that when you talk about southern europe as a region and would that give us some answers for the negative attitude that we're experiencing so this kind of the three elements uh that i was thinking um i mean there are tons of things to discuss but you've really given us food for thought and thank you again for the excellent excellent presentation Okay, Irene, thank you very much. And uh, always your enthusiasm about, you know, talking to you who has the same kind of enthusiasm as me is always very refreshing for me. And of course, the secret here is that my first degree is in history. And that's why I do tend to think a bit like a historian. And I tend to think that history is very important. Uh, so that's probably also why we tend to see eye to eye on quite a few topics. Um, so one of the things um, that I should mention about using the Eurobarometer, besides the other things that we um, that I that I said earlier, is the fact that in comparison to the public opinion polls that are carried out at a national level, either for governments and political parties privately or else published in the national newspapers, the Eurobarometer has many many more questions about Europe. You know the the. Uh, surveys that were carried out in Greece tended throughout the crisis only to ask whether people wanted the euro or a return to the drachma. And that produced a very positive response, which was interpreted in Greece by policymakers as being a proxy for support for the EU. And what you only got from the Eurobarometer was this swelling of discontent because it's the Eurobarometer that asks the questions about what kind of image do you have of the EU? You know, it asks all these soft questions designed to see, uh, to, to probe these um, attitudes deeper. So, uh, policy, you know, if policymakers are responding only to opinion polls conducted at a national level and not actually reading the Eurobarometer, then uh, their response is going to be different. And I think that this is why people were so shocked at the outcome of the um, Greek referendum, which I showed you earlier. Um, it wasn't expected, but anybody who had looked at the Eurobarometer would go, uh oh, when there was a referendum, because there's a lot of deep resentment in Greece in, by 2015 about the EU. And you're giving them an opportunity to say, <laughs> no, we don't want this. Um, the, out the outcome, uh, was surprising because of how high it was, but to me, the outcome, the actual no answer was not so surprising. I expected it to be a little bit lower. Um, so events driven, public opinion is very sensitive to events. And that's also something that's very clear when you're looking at the Eurobarometer. And so something can happen which makes public opinion very much more positive or very much more negative um, and then it can be just a kind of flicker and then it goes back down again. It was a very good example in the 1990s when Greece is referred to the European Court of Justice over the sanctions on the, um, the then uh, former Yugoslav Republic of Macedonia. That had a really negative impact on Greek public opinion, but it lasted about six months and then things kind of reverted. 
Um, and I, I cannot um, resist responding to what you said about the enthusiasm about the, um, the European integration project in the UK in the late 1980s. You know, the, the early 1990s is the only time in the Eurobarometer where you actually have a majority of British people saying that membership of the EC is a good thing and it lasts a very few years. And I think it's a response, as in the whole of Europe, it's a response to the end of the Cold War. But I think there's also a domestic factor, and that is the way in which the European community was coming to be seen as a defender of the rights of British workers, um, the European social space. Okay, so this is a typical example of the way in which public opinion is, is very events driven. You know, people are responding to what they read in the newspapers. Um, and if you ask them a question about something the day after they've read something in the newspaper that's made them very angry, you're likely to get an angry response. You're not likely to get, you know, necessarily a really considered response. That's another thing about looking at public opinion, that often opinions expressed are very contradictory. Okay, you can get contradictory opinions. Uh, people are in favour of free trade and they're in favour of pr protectionism. You ask them the same que the, those two questions in an opinion poll and you'll find that they're saying completely contradictory things. So, um, yes, I probably didn't answer all your points, but that's just a little starter. <laughs>